Hi, this is Chris Savage from RL Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the Faith Foundations. Uh, today, we'll be looking at the topic of God the Father. I pray that it would be a blessing to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thank you for coming along. So we're looking at God the Father tonight. At the last two sessions, we did the Trinity. So now we're looking at the individuals within uh, the Trinity or the Triunity. And this, the first one is God the Father. Uh, in John 1, 18, it says that no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. So straight away, we see there, we see a son and the father. So, you know, that, that sort of sets the tone for the rest of what we're going to do. Now, the doctrine of the Trinity that we did, it teaches that there are three specific persons in the Godhead. And who they are, well, we know for a fact that they are God the Father, there is God the Son, and there is the Holy Spirit. Now, in most biblical studies, the two persons which the most attention is focused on is, is, is God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Um, as a result, most believers have a... a have an unclear idea of exactly who God the Father is and exactly what God the Father does and what is he responsible for, because most everything is, is around about the Son and the Holy Spirit. So what we're going to do in this study is we're going to see that we're going to discuss God the Father in two specific areas. First up, we're going to see the fatherhood of God, and secondly, the works of God the Father. So that's just two areas we're going to study, the fatherhood of God and the works of God the Father. So first up, we're going to see that uh, um, we're going to look at uh, six different aspects of the fatherhood of God. Uh, we're going to see that he is the father of the Messiah. He's the father of creation. He's the father of angels. He's the father of all men. He's the father of Israel, specifically as a nation, and he's the father of believers, all believers. So first up, we're going to look at uh, the fatherhood of God in relationship to the father as being the father of the Messiah. The fact that God the father is the father of the Messiah, uh, Jesus or, or Yeshua, the son, we can see that in five different ways. Yeah, the first way we look at, we will see that uh, we'll see that God is seen as the Father of the Messiah, the Son, uh, and the Son was begotten by the Father. And this is taught in the Old Testament in Psalm chapter two, verse seven, where the psalmist writes, "I will tell of the decree. Jehovah said unto me, You are my Son." This day have I begotten you. Now, in the New Testament, we see something very similar in John chapter 1, verse 14, where we see John the Apostle writing, and he says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1.18 reads that no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared it. And again, we see something similar in John chapter 3, verse 16, where very, very uh, uh, common passage, very well-known passage. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God sent not the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. Again, we see in, 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 in John's epistle, in, in 1 John 4, 9, uh, John again writes here, he says that herein was the love of God manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. So the fact that the Messiah was begotten by the father has often been misinterpreted because some groups, uh, mainly uh, those 
in, in amongst the cults, they teach that Jesus is not eternal and they interpret the term begotten of the father to mean that Jesus was created by God the father. But actually the term begotten actually emphasizes uniqueness in that Jesus is the unique son of God. He's not his creation. So while the fatherhood of God has, has several aspects, there is a uniqueness in the relationship with the son. So the term begotten by the father does not mean that Jesus was created by God the father. But it means that the fatherhood son uh, sonship relationship is a very unique relationship. Uh, and this is simply not true of other relationships. Um, God's fatherhood of the Messiah is seen in that he is begotten by the father, meaning he is the unique son of God. He has a unique relationship and not true of other father son relationships. Uh, in fact, just um, if back in Genesis, we, we see that Abraham, uh, you know, who was going to sacrifice his son Isaac, God says to him, he says, take your son, your only son. Uh, but actually, Isaac wasn't his only son. He had Ishmael. But uh, the reason he, uh, God calls him his only son was because he was unique. He was a unique son in that he was a son of promise. He, so he was like a begotten son, your only begotten son. Okay, so the second thing we see here regarding the father of the Messiah is that uh, the father himself acknowledged Jesus to be his, his own son. And one example we see is in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, uh, where God the father, he's, he's speaking out of heaven at the baptism of Jesus, and he states that this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So what we see here is that God the Father acknowledged Jesus to be the son. So Jesus is acknowledged by the Father as his son. Now, uh, he's also the third way that the fatherhood of God is seen is that Jesus, the son, actually acknowledged God the Father as being his father. In, uh, in Matthew 11, verse 27, it, Jesus speaking, he says, All things have been handed over to me by my father. And then in John uh, chapter 8, verse 54, again, Jesus speaking, he says, It is my father who glorifies me. And in, further on in John, John chapter 14, verses 12 to 13, uh, Jesus again speaking, he says, greater works than these will he do, speaking of, of believers, because I am going to the Father. And he says, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. Why? That the Father may be glorified in the Son. So Jesus himself acknowledges God, the Father, as his Father. Uh, we also see that the fatherhood of God is also seen regarding Messiah, uh, Jesus, in that other men acknowledge Jesus to be the son of his father. And that God the father was the father of the Messiah. And, and one example of this we can find in Matthew 16, verse 16, where Peter, he made... His great confession uh, when Jesus says, but you men, who do you say that I am? And, and Peter said, literally Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of the God, the living one. So Peter acknowledged Jesus to be the son of God. Therefore, God, the father must be the father of the Messiah, the father of Jesus. Other examples of this are found in Mark chapter 15, verse 39, uh, which, which by the centurion, it says, and when the centurion who stood facing Jesus, facing him, he saw that in this way, he breathed his last. And he said, centurion said, truly, this man was the son of God. So the centurion acknowledged 
that God was the father of Jesus, the man on the cross. And again, in Romans 8.32, uh, where we have the apostle Paul here acknowledges that Jesus is God's son. He says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So what we see here is that Jesus was acknowledged to be the son of God by men. And this again emphasized that God the father is the father of the Messiah. Also, we see that demons actually acknowledged that Jesus was the son of God the father. And then we see this in uh, in one example, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 28 to 29, it says, And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gadarenes, there met him two possessed with demons. They were coming forth out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man could pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you? You son of God, how you come hither to torment us before the time. So in these verses in, in Matthew 8, 28 to 29, we have demons who are speaking here and they acknowledge that Jesus was the son of God. So that would automatically then mean that, that God is the father of the Messiah. And so this is part of this first section we're looking at where in regard to the fatherhood of God, where we are seeing that. God is the father of the Messiah. Now we see in the second part here, we see that uh, God is also, God the father is also the father of creation. Uh, this is to do with his fatherhood. Um, and one example of this truth we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, where, where Paul writes here and he says, Yet to us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we unto him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and we through him. So in this passage, Paul is here, uh, uh, it, it, Paul addresses, that the, the Father is addressed as God, the Father, it, it, so he's, he's God the Father, and he's connected with creation, in that he is the Father of creation. So back in Genesis 1.1, uh, 1, 1, we see that uh, God the Father is the source of all. And then the Lord Jesus Christ, we see in Colossians 1.16, he, he is the agent of creation. So we have God the Father, he is the father of creation. A second example we find in James uh, 1 verse 17 where we see there James writing and he says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the father of lights with whom they can be, with whom can be no variation, neither shadow that is cast by turning. So in this verse, he's addressed as the father and is called the father of lights, a title that connects him again with creation itself. The third aspect we see in regard to the fatherhood is that God is the father of all angels. He is the father of all angels. So now for that reason, angels are referred to as the sons of God. And there are four scriptures that teach this truth. Uh, the first passage is in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, which mentions the sons of God. In Genesis 6, verse 2, uh, uh, Moses writes, he says, The sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Now, in, in this Genesis 6, 1 to 4 passage, some interpret the term sons of God uh, to refer to the descendants of Seth as opposed to the descendants of Cain. Now, there are three other passages which we need to look at and, and three other passages. One of them 
is John, is, sorry, Job uh, chapter one, verse six, where we see it says, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. Uh, two other passages here. Jo again, Job chapter two, verse one. Again, we see the same term. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And in Job 38, verse 7, it says, When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So uh, the, these passages in uh, in Job, um, uh, clearly show that the term sons of God must refer to angels. Uh, angels are God's sons in the sense that they are his creation, which we see in, in 38 verse 7. And they came to present or station themselves uh, before God to report on their activities. And then we see Satan, you know, the accuser was also with them. So he had and he still actually has access to heaven. So all of these scriptures use the term sons of God, and in those contexts, no one doubts that they refer to angels. So you can't just have people saying, well, Genesis 6, 1 to 4, where it says sons of God, it, it's, it, it means something different to the other three passages. We need to be consistent in the way that we interpret scripture and the way scripture is used. So consistency must be maintained and therefore Genesis 6 uh, where it says sons of God must also refer to angels. We see that God is the father of all men. Um, he's the father of all men and we see an example of this in Acts chapter 17 verse 29. Being then the offspring of God we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and device of man. So this verse here states that all men are the offspring of God. And in one sense, there is the universal fatherhood of God of all men. Why? Because he's, he's a father of all men in that he's man's creator. You, you know, man came from the creation of God. In the same way, he is the father of all angels. Now, it's, it's, uh, it's unfortunate here that the liberals have, have, have stuck on, on this aspect, ignoring the others. Yes, the Bible does teach that there is the universality of the fatherhood of God. It, it does teach that. He is indeed the father of all men, but only in relationship of the creator to the created. It does not mean as, as the, you know, the, the, the liberals teach uh, that this automatically means a universal salvation, that all people will be saved anyway because God is the father of all men. The Bible does not teach that act that all people are going to be saved. Because God is the father of all men does not mean that all men are going to be saved. It means only that God is the creator of all men. Another example where he's said to be the father of all men is Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 15. And here Paul writes and he says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the father from whom Every family in heaven, angelic, and on earth is named. So in this passage, the concepts of family and the fatherhood of God are brought together. And this too emphasizes the universality of the fatherhood of God. He is the father of all men by virtue of being the creator of all men. A third example we see here is found in Hebrews 12, verse 9, where it, um, the writer of Hebrews says, Furthermore, we had the fathers of our flesh to chasten us, and we gave them reverence. 
shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? So God the Father is spoken of as being the Father of spirits without distinction. And again, he is the Father of all men, not in a salvation relationship, but in a creation relationship. Uh, and so we see that there is a universality of the fatherhood of God because he is the creator of all men. We see also that he is the father of Israel. And this is the fifth aspect of the fatherhood of God. He's the father of Israel. And this is brought in a number of times in the Old Testament. Uh, one example we can find is in Exodus 4, verse 22, where um, we see here God talking to Moses, and you shall say unto Pharaoh, thus says Jehovah, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So God called Israel Jehovah's son. Now, as a nation, Israel is the national son of God. No nation is ever called the son of God except one, and that is Israel. A second example we find in Deuteronomy 32, verse 6, where uh, he says here, Do ye thus requite Jehovah, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he your father that has brought you, that has bought you? He has made you and established you. So in this passage in Deuteronomy 32, 6, Moses pointed out very clearly that God the Father is also the Father of Israel. Israel as a nation is God's son, God's firstborn son. We see also in Isaiah 64, verse 8, where Israel is called, uh, is said to be the son of God. Isaiah 64, verse 8, but now, O Jehovah, Thou art our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. Jeremiah 3 verse 4. My father, thou art the guide of my youth. And this is talking on behalf of Israel. A fifth example is Hosea chapter 11 verse 1. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. So this is a, this is a, a, a this is speaking about Israel, the national son, but it's also a prophecy about the Messiah. And finally, we find in Malachi chapter 1, verse 6, also emphasizes this unique relationship of Israel as the son of God. Because Malachi 1, 6 says, A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is mine honor? And if I'm a master, where is my fear? Says Jehovah of hosts unto you, O priests that despise my name. And you say, wherein have we despised your name? So God is addressing Israel here and God reminds Israel that he is their father and Israel is his son and as the father, he should have honor and respect from Israel as a nation. We see that, that the sixth aspect of the fatherhood of God is that he is the father of believers. And in John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become children of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, this is his unique relationship now in the salvation sense, because uh, speaking of God, the father as being the father of all men emphasizes uh, God as the creator of all men from whom all men then receive their life. But that does not guarantee the salvation of all men. Because every individual must exercise that personal act of faith. And so what we see here is that God the Father is now uniquely the father of believers by virtue of the new birth, by virtue of regeneration. And it is this relationship of God the Father to believers that now reflects the salvation aspect of God the Father in relationship to believers. 
uh, we have become the children of God in a salvation sense. Other passages that uh, refer to God as the father of believers include uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, where uh, Matthew says, so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven, Matthew writes, and in Matthew 6, 6, but when you pray, this is Jesus, he says, when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And then in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, where John is writing, he says, see what kind of love the father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. And he harkens back to, to his own gospel. Okay. Yeah, this is the second um, aspect of, of, of God. This is the second area we're looking at. And this is the works of God the Father. Now, whereas we saw the fatherhood aspects that actually distinguished him from the other two persons of the Trinity, uh, as far as personality is concerned, uh, which the works of God, the Father distinguishes him, the Father, from the Son and from the Holy Spirit. So we see uh, three separate personalities here, uh, each distinguished. Now, first up, we see that God the Father generates the Son for all eternity. And in the passage is John chapter 5, verses 17 to 26. Verse 26 says, For as the Father hath life in himself, even so gave he to the Son also to have life in himself. And secondly, it is God the Father who is the author of the decree that brings to pass all that he wills. We see this in Psalm uh, chapter 2, verses 7 to 9. In, in verses 7 to 8, uh, he says here, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possessions. So what we see here is that uh, speaking about this, this is uh, in a, a God, he, the father generates the son for all eternity uh, in, in this way. It doesn't mean that the son was never eternal. It, it means that in, in his humanity, he's now been generated for all eternity. Thirdly, the work of election is said to be the work of God the Father. We see in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blemish before him in love, having foreordained us unto adoption as sons through Jesus Christ unto himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. So the work of election is the work of God the Father. He is the one who foreordained us unto adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. Now, and this was all done before the foundation of the world. Now, fourth thing we see here is that it is God the Father who sent the Son to do the work of redemption. And this we find in, in John chapter 5, verse 36. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, very works that I am doing, uh, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. So the Son was sent by the Father for the purpose or for the work of redemption. And fifth, it is God the Father who disciplines his children uh, because he is the Father of believers. He has the right to discipline believers. So the work of divine discipline is a work of God the Father, and we can find this in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 9, where, where the writer there says, Furthermore, we had the fathers of our flesh to chasten us, and we gave them reverence. 
Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? So here we see uh, that this is this discipline uh, for believers comes from God the Father. Um, believers are disciplined, non-believers are judged. Okay, so that was a, 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 a short and a sweet study on, on God the Father. Uh, there, that's our um, uh, contact details there if you need to contact us.